Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I want to tell you about some project that's been we've been working on for quite some time now, and it's joint with a lot of people. So Tom Braden, uh, June He, who's here, Nick Proudfoot, and Bo Tong Wong. So these people are from UMass Amherst, IAS, Oregon, and Wisconsin Madison. So th this title has all kind of uh, words in it, but let's start very simple. Okay, so I want to start with a vector space and I want to have a finite collection of hyperplanes inside this vector space so that the intersection of all of these hyperplanes is the origin, is the zero vector. So a flat is going to be a subspace that I get by intersecting some collection of my hyperplanes. Okay, so let's do an example. So here's three lines inside of R2. I have three hyperplanes inside of some vector space. And I want to kind of write down all of these flats in some nice way. So here's, here's sort of some nice diagram that, include, that, that keeps all the information of my flats. So first, um, if I intersect none of the flats, I end up with this vector space V at the bottom. If I take any one of the flats, well, I have the hyperplanes that I start with. And as soon as I intersect two of the flats, if I intersect any two of them, if I intersect any two of the hyperplanes, I get the origin. Okay. So that's what's going on here. And if I intersect three of the hyperplanes, I still get the origin. So there's no new subspaces here. OK, and I've drawn these things in a particularly nice way. Well, I get a post set. I get a lattice. So in, in particular, there's some order here where it's ordered by reverse inclusion. So uh, this guy is bigger than this one because 0 is contained in this hyperplane. And this one's bigger than this one because this, this line is contained inside of this plane. Okay, and this is a ranked lattice, meaning that it's ranked by co-dimension. So the co-dimension of the entire vector space is zero. This one's one, and this is co-dimension two. Okay, so I want to tell you about something called the top-heavy conjecture, which says that if I have one of these lattice of flats, then if I draw some imaginary line through the middle, horizontal line through the middle of it, then if I start at the top and go down some number of levels and start at the bottom and go up the same number of levels where I don't cross that line, then there will be more flats on this level than this one. That's what the top heavy conjecture says. Okay. So, I mean, in this example, there's not much going on because this thing is very symmetric. Okay. Let's look at a bigger example. So I'm going to take four generic planes inside R3. And I don't want to draw the picture because I don't know how uh, inside tech. <laughs> um, but here's the lattice of flats. Okay, So here, uh, I have my vector space, and I have my four planes. And then if I intersect any two of the planes, I get a line. So there are six lines I can get that way. And then if I intersect three of the planes, I get the 0 vector. OK, again, uh, reverse inclusion and rank 0, 1, 2, 3 co-dimension. OK, so the top heavy conjecture here basically says that 6 is bigger than 4. OK, because if I draw a horizontal line through the middle, um, there are six elements here. So I go down one step, go up one step, there are more here than here. 6 is bigger than 4. OK, so this top heavy conjecture was conjectured by Dowling and Wilson in, in 1974. And this is what it says, but it's, I've been saying it. OK, and this was proven 43 years later by Jun He and Bo Tong Wong in, in 2017. OK. And I want to kind of walk you through um, a bit of the proof. And it's, what's important here is that we have to use geometry. So we want to build some kind of variety out of this, this hyperplane arrangement and then study the, the topology of this thing. OK? So let me walk you through this. So I have my original vector space. And I can con consider the quotient map where I quotient by any of the hyperplanes. OK? Now if I take all of these quotient maps together, so I, can, I get a map from v to the direct sum of v mod h over all of the hyperplanes. Okay? That has kernel 0. So I, I get some injection here. Okay? So now, well, since I had a hyperplane, so v mod h is just going to be a one-dimensional aff affine space. Okay? And a1 embeds inside a p1. So all of this I'm saying is that I can look at v inside of a product of p1s, one for every hyperplane. And I'm going to define some variety called y. I'm going to call y, or the Schubert variety of the arrangement. And this, I'm going to call it this because, well, it has some kind of analogs to the Schubert varieties that you see um, in flag varieties. 
So it's just going to be the closure of this vector space inside of a product of P1s. OK. So since, since, I mean, this is sort of a lot of things, I'll show you an example. So if we start with this, this vector space we began with in the first example, then this variety y has sort of inside of a neighborhood of 0, 0, 0, it looks like this original vector space. And on the other end of the world, inside of a neighborhood of infinity, 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 it's some singular variety. OK? So it looks like a con. And this, this variety y, um, it's a singular projective variety, but it has a stratification by affine spaces. Okay, which is going to be very important for, for sort of this proof of the top-heavy conjecture that Junhe and Botong Wang had. So let me tell you some consequences of having a stratification by affine spaces. Okay, so the first thing is, well, Y has a cell decomposition. Okay, so it has no odd-dimensional cohomology. And if I look at the 2K degree cohomology, its dimension is the number of flats in rank K. OK, hi. When you say stratified, it's witness stratified? Yes, yep, mm -hmm. that's right. OK, so it has a cell decomposition. And we know the dimensions. So if we wanted to prove this top-heavy conjecture, well, basically, we need an injection from this degree cohomology to this one. That would say that there are more things here than here. OK, so I'm going to go back to the second point in a second. OK, well. If y were smooth, we'd have something called the hard left shets theorem, which tells us that we do have an injection. OK, but y is not smooth, so it's singular. So when we have singular varieties, rather than looking at singular cohomology that you learn in algebraic topology, sort of the right thing a lot of times to look at is intersection cohomology. OK, this is sort of like a nice cohomology theory for singular varieties. OK, and it turns out that if you have a singular projective variety, you, you have this hard left shets theorem. OK, so this number two is saying, well, intersection cohomology of a variety is always a module over cohomology of that variety. But this, this map is not always an injection. But when you have this, this stratification by affine cells, it is. OK, so what we want to do is try to use the hard left shets theorem here and this injection to try to get an injective map here. OK, so we set up some kind of commutative diagram. OK. So I don't want to say too, too much. Uh, this diagram commutes. This is an injection, the one by Buhner and Eckerdahl that I just told you about. We have the hard left shed theorem. We actually have an isomorphism here. So just formally, since we have a commutative diagram with two injections and an isomorphism, this thing has to be an injection. OK? So this, this is, is the top heavy conjecture um, by Jun He and Bo Tsong Wong in 2017 for hyperplane arrangements. OK. So what are we thinking about now? Well, there's some sort of generalization of, of linear algebra, one could say, which is called matroid theory. Okay? But when you have an arbitrary matroid, you don't have hyperplane arrangements. You don't have vectors in a vector space. So you don't have, I don't have a vector space to start with, so I, don't, I can't build this variety. Okay? So how can, I, how can I prove this sort of top-heavy conjecture for all matroids when I don't have geometry floating around? So let me just say a few words about matroids. I won't give you a definition. I'll just say some words to, to give you a flavor. OK, so a matroid, it was, it was introduced by Whitney in 1935. It's some gadget that, that, like I said, generalizes the notion of linear independence or dependence of vectors in a vector space. So what is it? It has a, a ground set, which is some finite set. You could think of like some finite collection of vectors in a vector space. OK, and it has a collection of distinguished subsets. You could think of any one of these words. Like I could tell you which ones are the independent sets, the bases, the closed sets, the circuits, satisfying some axioms that mirror the ones in linear algebra. Some examples, like I said, vectors in a vector space, hyperplane arrangements I've been telling you about. There's some kind of dependence notion from, from graphs that comes with cycles in the graph. OK? But the point is that these matroids kind of satisfy some axioms and I mean, not every hyperplane, I mean, not every matroid is realizable. You can't view them all as vectors in a vector space. There are some matroids that you, you just can't find a vector space over some field where you can realize them as vectors in a vector space. OK, so this is the point. So not all matroids can be realized as vectors in a vector space. OK, so since we don't have vector space, we don't have geometry. But this top heavy conjecture makes sense in this case. OK, makes sense for arbitrary matroids because 
a Metroid comes equipped, one of the definitions, one of the equivalent definitions of a Metroid is it comes equipped with this lattice of flats, this kind of post set that I was using to do everything with. Okay? And this, this thing is a ranked lattice, it has a rank function. So it makes sense to, to write down this, this top heavy conjecture. And in fact, that's, that's the generality that Dowling and Wilson wrote it in in 1974. Okay? So just to recap, this is the, the general statement. It's known for, for realizable matroids, but it's not known in general. Okay, so what can we do? Realizable is vector space. Yeah, I mean, vector, I, what I mean by realizable is there exists a vector space over some field. That That's more general than what you just explained. What's that? That's more general than the proof of uh, one we said. Yeah, yeah, but there's some things about if, if it's realizable over some field, then it's realizable somewhere else. There's some reductions you can make. Okay. Good. So I probably have one or two more minutes. So let's look back to geometry to try to figure out what to do. OK? So remember I had this, this variety y, this singular projective variety. I won't say the details about this, but there's, there's a well-defined series of blow-ups you can do to get a resolution y tilde, and we, we know how to do this. We have some nice canonical resolution. Okay, And it turns out that, well, if you look, what are, what are the key players in this whole thing? I mean, we have the cohomology of y, and I want to look at the cohomology of this resolution. So even if the matroid is not realizable, there's some, there's some kind of ring that you can define, which I'll call b of m and a of m, just in terms of the matroid. Okay, you can always define it just in terms of the matroid. And it turns out that when the matroid is realizable, these rings are isomorphic to the cohomology rings of these. Okay, so these are the objects that we want to work with. We want to study these. But remember that intersection cohomology was a key player here. Okay, because we had to use this hard left shed's theorem. Okay, for intersection cohomology. So just to remind you, this, this B ring, this is, is supposed to be the cohomology of Y when the matroid is realizable, A is supposed to be the cohomology of the resolution. So what one could do is try to set up a commutative diagram like this. But a lot of things are missing now, OK? So kind of using the, this geometry, this, this realizable picture as, as some motivation, what one could do is try to take this graded ring and decompose it as a module over this graded ring. OK? And what you want to do is find some nice sum n of A as, as a B module, some nice indecomposable sum n, that is supposed to act like the intersection cohomology of Y. OK? This is what you're supposed to do. And then you have to prove that you have an injection so that you have these, these horizontal arrows. And you have the hard, like a really hard part is trying to prove that you have hard left shets for this, this sort of combinatorially defined module. Okay? And if you were able to do this, then the same sort of, I mean, this B ring, we already know, we know the definition of this, and it has the property that its graded dimensions are exactly the number of flats in whatever degree you want. So we need an injection here just like before. Okay? So if we're able to, to, to follow these, these, these steps here, then we have an isomorphism in two, two injections. So we would, we would formally get an injection here. And that would Im imply the top heavy conjecture for all matroids. Okay, so this is some kind of the, the stuff we're thinking about. There's a lot of stuff that, that's, um, that's interesting here. Like, there's a whole, I just want to say a word, and if you're interested, you can come talk to me. So there's a whole kajdan lustig theory of matroids um, that, that comes about, like, studying the, there's, like, for every matroid, there's a unique polynomial called the kajdan lustig polynomial. You can associate it to it. Um, it has to do with the geometry of this, this Schubert variety of the arrangement. There's a whole analogous story. So I don't talk about any of that, but we're thinking about this, this kind of stuff too. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs>